I want to make a small announcement. Hello. Uh, I want you to remember that tomorrow, uh, after the last talk, which is that of uh, Stefano Boccaletti, uh, it will be presented the prize to the best poster. Okay? So that will be just the closing session. Okay, thank you. So now we can start. Okay, I think it's... Uh, we could start because most of us are here and it's a long session ahead. Uh, so uh, before that, I also wanted to sort of uh, congratulate all the young people who are presenting posters. Uh, some They were really good, so uh, since you mentioned about the price. So uh, the first talk will be by Jose, and uh, he'll be talking about uh, non-Newtonian turbulence, animal scalings, and non-universality. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll let you know when five minutes are. Does it work? Yes. Yes, okay, good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, always a nice place to come. Very nice conference, very nice speakers. And a lot of friends, so I'm happy. Uh, so the title, is, the title of my talk is kind of full of uh, complicated words. Some of them are negative, some of them are positive. I hope to be able to explain you somehow <laughs> What do they mean during the, the, the talk? So in fact, this is the second time I present for this uh, group of nonlinear dynamics people. And uh, now I have some new developments and more understanding of what I did, of what we did. And then that's why I decided to present it again to some of you that have been already in Punta del Este. That, that was also a very nice conference. So uh, the title is Self-Organization and Non-Universal Anomalous Scaling in Non-Newtonian Turbulence. So it's important to give some, uh, I know that there has been two talks already about turbulence here, Professor Minini and Professor Eckhart. And uh, I always want to give some introductory concepts so that it makes more easy for me to explain what I want to do. And uh, of course, we have to talk about this great uh, scientist and artist who was Leonardo da Vinci. And he was perhaps the first to identify uh, turbulence uh, as a scientific matter as well as a, an artistic one. So he produced uh, very nice figures showing water flowing through a square hole into a pool, which is this, this one here, and as well as water flowing against obstacles. The precision of his uh, paintings are impressive. And uh, of course, this uh, motivated many people afterwards to try to understand this very nice and complex subject. Uh, so I would like to talk about, uh, so, so this, what is turbulence? Turbulence in fluid dynamics is typically a, a symmetry breaking type of transition that you see when, when a fluid is moving. So I took here the example of a flow through an obstacle, and the first one is, uh, and then what we do here, uh, flow laminar to turbulent, and we, what we do here, we have, it's, it's important to explain first that we are usually talking about what is a Newtonian fluid. So a Newtonian fluid, in terms of concept, is a fluid which has a constant viscosity. So it's important that we explain that. And how do you, how do you uh, quantify the transition from what we call a viscous flow or Stokes flow to turbulent flow is usually made in terms of the Reynolds number, which simply uh, correlates the, the inertial forces to the viscous forces which is taking place in the fluid. 
through its flow. And here, as you can see, you are increasing the low Reynolds number. If you have a very low Reynolds number, it's, it's called a, a viscous flow because the viscosity is very high. So you have a perfect symmetrical type of uh, fluid flow through this obstacle. As you start increasing, you break the symmetry around the uh, y-axis in this particular case, as you can see. But you are still under the laminar condition, so you don't have laminar because you have lamina of fluid which flows each other in, inside of the system. So you can keep increasing, and then you start generating the first vortexes in this in the system at Reynolds equal to 20, perhaps, which this is a Reynolds based on the particle diameter here that we have. So at the incipient uh, transition from laminar to turbulence, you start seeing uh, symmetry breaking wherever, everywhere in, the, everywhere in the system. This is what happens, for instance, at Reynolds equal 200, approximately, and you start seeing what people call the von Karman wake type of structures. So eventually, if you increase even more, one order of magnitude, then you cannot quantify uh, any more structures in well-defined and deterministic patterns, so you reach the turbulent behavior itself. Okay? So, uh, so, so people then try to theorize, to develop theories and paradigms to describe this very interesting phenomenon. And the first one of them was, I mean, not the first one, but very relevant, was Sir Leo, Lewis uh, Richardson. And he visualized turbulence as uh, composed of a cascade of vortices. These vortices would have different sizes. And through these vortices, energy should be passed down from larger to small scales till of course, at a very small time scale, at a very small length scale, the kinetic energy of the fluid should be dissipated by heat uh, through viscous friction. So only at a very small scale, uh, spatial scale, is that viscosity uh, plays a role. So that was the vision of Lichard. Of course, this is a pictorial vision. You don't see vortices breaking up. They are, it's very difficult to visualize this thing. The, the, the concept of eddies and vortices is ambiguous in the turbulence literature itself, but it's a nice concept in the sense that you can understand uh, what eventually Kolmogorov, what eventually was called the Kolmogorov scale, and it's this picture here. So now if you, if you manage to measure the energy, the local energy in the system, and you plot uh, the local energy according to different wave numbers of the system, different length scales, what do you see is that uh, you have a regime what we, call, what we call the inertial effect, inertial effect, where inertial effects are important, and which will generate the energy cascade. So you have an energy input here, from whatever, from outside. So the, the, the cascade of, uh, this described by Richardson will follow this very nice power law. Eventually, I will tell you how that, that was discovered and, the, and if there is a theory for that. And only at very uh, large wave numbers or very small length scales, the energy will be dissipated by viscous friction. So, so if this is true, of course, and it is true, so the question is, what is the role of rheology? By rheology, I mean here, uh, fluid which doesn't have, for instance, a constant viscosity. So if you have a fluid, and it's very common in nature, I'll show you some examples here. So if the, if the rheology has a, has a role, it, won't, it would only have a role at this scale here, and not would be able to uh, change the inertial the inertial effects, and therefore not will be able to change or to transform it, transform the energy cascade proposed by Richardson uh, himself. <coughs> so, I would like to show you what is what is a non-Newtonian fluid. This is a very typical example here. Very very important to use it in Brazil nowadays, especially in some regions, in some uh, regions of Brazil. If you have a safer body armor and. Uh, <laughs> So a typical safer body armor is, is, is made of uh, three layers of uh, polymer. <coughs> and, uh, and it works like that. You, know? you have a bullet which reaches it, and uh, you, you see the propagation. But if you now mix these uh, fibers with a non-Newtonian fluid that I will show you how does it behave, physically speaking, and it will have a different type of behavior. So this now is the same uh, fibers, but now mixed with this fluid. So this is the, the difference in, in behavior that you have. And you add a, a non-Newtonian fluid. Uh, other examples of non-Newtonian fluids are ketchup, for instance, which is a typically a, sheer, a thinning fluid, very important one, and others that you can see in nature. Okay. So for that particular fluid that I showed you, it has very, very interesting behavior. So the viscosity, oops, sorry, the viscosity of the fluid changes with the shear rate. It changes according to the way you move, for instance, because you are wearing this uh, body armor. So it, it, is, it initially decreases with the shear rate, so it's a flexible, it becomes more, 
is slightly more flexible as you move a little bit faster. But eventually, if you reach a certain threshold, a certain value of shear stress, it will become very hard, very viscous, almost in a singularity way. So it will almost follow a singular behavior. And then this particular fluid is a mixture of colloidal silica and uh, polyethylene, uh, polyethylene glycol. And at, at, at equilibrium, you see this type of behavior. So the fluid is dispersed. We are talking about low zero stress. As you increase the shear rate, it will follow uh, layers uh, which somehow are organized inside of the fluid, and eventually, when, when you increase even more the, sh the, the, the stress, the shear sickening behavior of the fluid will appear, will emerge, and then we will follow clusters which will somehow block the entire flow into the system. Okay? So, now we go for non-Newtonian turbulence. We talked about everything that has been made, uh, that has been talked about, not made, uh, was uh, in terms of Newtonian talking about a, a, a constant viscosity <laughs> fluid. So, so we did this, uh, this work, and uh, in order to do that, in order to introduce some sort of non-Newtonian flow in a system and try to understand turbulence, we did some numerical analysis, because now, as I, show, as I will show you, we, you have two non-linearities in the generalized equations of mass conservation and momentum conservation. So we consider here a cubic box containing a non-Newtonian fluid, and I will explain in the relogy of this fluid later, and it should be subjected to periodic boundary conditions in all three dimensions. Uh, the mathematical formulation of this, uh, the fluid mechanics, is based on, first, the continuity equation. So this is a, we, we assume here that the fluid is incompressible, so the, the density of the fluid is constant. What changes here is the viscosity. And the second one is the momentum conservation equation. So the momentum conservation equation is not the Navier-Stokes equation. Why? Because it has this component, it has this component, it has this component, which are the same for uh, Newtonian fluid, but it has also this different component, which is a generalized way to assume how vis the, the viscous forces will be incorporated in the system. So the, in this particular case now, we have two nonlinearities: the inertial and the claimed one, which generates turbulence itself, which is here. So this is the monster of the navier stokes equation because it's a weak nonlinearity which generates turbulence itself. And now you have this one here, as you can see. This is the stress tensor, but the stress tensor, which should be uh, proportional to the strain rate tensor, it's, it, it now has a viscosity which is a function of the strain rate itself. So that's why it's a, a non-Newtonian fluid, because it has a rheology in which the viscosity changes according to the stress rate, as I showed you for that fluid, which fills up the body armors uh, from the movie I showed you, okay? So, uh, uh, again, the deviatoric stress tensor is a function of the strain rate. The constant of proportionality is not a constant anymore. Uh, the strain rate, this is the second principal variant, is, the, is a function of the strain rate itself, which makes this term here also nonlinear, nonlinear. So you have two nonlinearities in your system. So, of course, it makes it difficult to solve analytically in any sense or in any sort of boundary conditions and operational conditions of your system. So that's why people usually go, and I went as well, to the numerical simulations. So what kind of fluids uh, we are using here? The, the kind of fluids, now I'm going to talk about the rheology, how the viscosity changes with the uh, strain rate. So we are using here... Uh, which is the constitu constitutive relation of the material itself. So uh, we are using cross-power law fluids. So a cross-power law fluid is a fluid which, in which the viscosity is uh, uh, proportional to the strain rate to a given power, n minus 1. And n is called the rheological exponent of this uh, cross-power law fluid. So the concept of, in this type of uh, rheological behavior, the concept of viscosity is preserved. Although it changes, but you have the concept of, of uh, uh, viscosity still present in the system. In other types of systems, like uh, uh, other types of uh, non-Newtonians, you might not have exactly the same, the same description in terms of a viscosity itself, whether it changes or, or not. So, uh, for instance, for a typical shear thinning type of behavior, this is, the, 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 this is what you would see for the viscosity varying with the strain rate. Okay, so you have a plateau because you have to define somehow uh, the, the, the threshold, the, the cutoffs for the viscosity, for the upper cutoff and the lower, lower cutoff of viscosity, and you have a power law in the middle. So when n is equal to 1, you recover the Newtonian fluid in which the viscosity itself is a constant. When n is larger than 1, you have a shear thickening fluid, uh, which would be the opposite of that. It would go like that. 
increases up and go uh, constant again. And when, when n is smaller than 1, you have shear thinning fluids. Okay. Well, okay, then we now know the equations which uh, 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 regulates the tension which governs our phenomenology, and uh, we have to add some additional statements on that. The first one is uh, a, a very important assumption, which is very close to what we call the uh, thermodynamic equilibrium in thermodynamics, and it's a central assumption that Kolmogorov himself used to develop the, four, uh, the K41 theory. And the, the, the assumption is that the fluid flow at a sufficiently large Reynolds number, of course, it's, it's a turbulent regime, is a homogeneous and locally isotropic state. So he wanted to avoid any type of effect on the boundary conditions and operational conditions of the system. So the so -called, this, is, this state of the fluid flow is so-called fully developed turbulence. So it's not so easy to, to, to make simulations or to... Uh, this is a very idealized concept, but it works to understand the uh, important concepts behind the, the turbulence phenomenon. So it, it can be described, in, in our particular case, we are using a linear forcing term to induce turbulence in our periodic box. Usually people use low wave number forcing in the Fourier uh, transformation of the Navier-Stokes and conservation equations. Here we are going for this linear forcing, which is kind of controversial in literature, some people like, some people don't like, but it's very, very convenient. Why is it convenient? Because it can work directly on the Navier-Stokes equation, on the generalized Navier-Stokes equation, uh, and we don't have to go to the Fourier space. We can work in the physical space itself, in real space, instead of the Fourier, and then deconvolute it later to obtain a solution. So this was proposed in 2004, 2005 from, uh, from Rosales and Menevo in a physics fluids paper. So here, as you can see here, this linear driving force leads the local velocity uh, in a feedback uh, time of control of first order to the uh, average velocity. So it's a typically non-local type of uh, uh, control of the system that you have. Like, for instance, we have in Maxwell a demon type when you do simulations in physical statistics. Okay. So, and then we did for that, we have to do, in order to try to understand the effect of the rheology on the turbulence, we did numerical simulations, and uh, using uh, direct numerical simulations. So we solved the generalized equations of uh, mass conservation and momentum conservation, and what we did, we uh, provided numerical solutions for the time evolution of the local velocity and pressure fields, because these are the dependent variables of our system, and we obtained that through an open source uh, code. We have no uh, pre prejudice against that. <laughs> and we use the code Jerry's, which is based on a second order finite volume scheme applied to an adaptively refined log tree mesh. So, and this sounds very reasonable, and the results, we could test it with other uh, codes and other uh, simulations performed in different papers of the literature. So the maximum refined level that we did was very small. I, I know that our ex experts in the audience, we could only go to 256 uh, to the cube, the uh, discretization of our triple per periodic box. Why did we do that? Because we had to change the rheological exponent as well as different uh, uh, operational conditions of the system, as well as the Reynolds number that we are applying here. So we couldn't go for very large systems, otherwise we could not compare different values of the uh, rheological exponents. So uh, now there is something else. I'm sorry for the, all these technicalities. It's important in the way that we do here to define regions which are called vortices, vortices in our system. So there are many ways to do that. We choose the one which was uh, originally developed in 1994 by Young and Hussein, and this is based uh, on the uh, eigenvalue lambda 2, which is uh, the second eigenvalue of the tensor M equal to the stress, the, to the, tens the stress tensor, plus the stress tensor, if you remember, is something which is related with the stress itself, but now with, with how the stress is uh, distributed in the, in the system, but now we also have to, to, you, to understand a little bit, uh, to introduce a little bit the effect of the vertical motion inside the system. So it's a combination of stress and vorticity. So this is what defines what is a vortex turning up in a three-dimensional system. I will show you that it, it, it somehow captures very interesting features of the turbulent system. So a vortex is defined here as a connected region in space which has at least two negative eigenvalues of this uh, tensor M here, okay? So, uh, so then what do you do? You apply it to your space uh, during the during a time of the numerical solution of the turbulent system, and then you 
the, you determine the eigenvalues up to the point in which you have this threshold here, or close to that. To that. I, it, it has to be is negative, but not necessarily zero. Why? Because we have finite size scaling effects here, which can be very important. So going to zero, you might, uh, if you go to zero in finite systems, you might end up with a single vortex uh, filling up the entire system. So uh, vortices are identified here as clusters. So it's a typical cluster algorithm of cells in the numerical mesh for which lambda two, for each uh, particular cell of the, the grid, uh, is, uh, is smaller than the threshold that you give, could be zero or smaller than zero, and the smaller the prescribed parameter, lambda two, the threshold, the smaller is the average volume which will enclose a given vortex in your system. So, so I have a movie, uh, a movie here. Okay, so this is a typical simulation of our system. Uh, so all these uh, surfaces here have been determined using this lambda two criteria. So these are regions which, in a way, capture the vorticity and the stress outside the vortex, okay? So again, I take just a snapshot of that to show you, for instance, this is a shear thickening fluid, shear thickening fluid, and then this is a snapshot. And I, I take this uh, cross-section here to try to analyze what does this lambda-2 criterion do. So what does it do? For instance, it captures the vorticity. Okay, so these are the surfaces which enclose the vortices for this criteria of lambda-2 is smaller than zero. So it captures the, the intense uh, vortical regions of, uh, of, of the turbulent system. And as well as outside the vortices, what do you see is the intensity of the stresses. So it localizes the vorticity. So that's why we call them vortices anyway. Okay? So, it, so uh, it shows that this lambda-2 criteria, at least visually, uh, is interesting to capture the vortical intensity of the system. So, uh, okay, so, so the question is now, okay, so what do we do here? Uh, so there was a big question on that is, okay, so uh, the, the structure of the turbulence, according to Kolmogorov, should be robust to the rheology. Why? Because the rheology only should, should only affect the turbulence at very low scales. If this is true, we would obtain some sort of distribution of vortexes which should be invariant to the rheology of the system. And that's exactly what we obtain. This is a, a result which, which, has, which is <coughs> expected, but not has been, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, identified, verified, even in numerical simulations. So that's what we did. We calculated the vortexes for different Reynolds number, and as well as for different uh, system size. So the distributions of vortices are approximately the same for different values of the rheological uh, exponent, whether they are uh, shear thinning or shear thickening. <coughs> so the, 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 the minus five-thirds structure, which is, preser is preserved uh, in terms of the vortical structure in the system. So. Uh, this was more or less expected, as I said, but we are now showing it at least uh, in an approximate way that it's uh, in, indeed true. So for that, we have to, to define many different things. The Reynolds number here, uh, because the fluid is here thinning, it doesn't have a fixed viscosity. So uh, the Taylor Reynolds number, and it also doesn't have a fixed uh, uh, spatial a characteristic size, so we have to define the viscosity in terms of an average viscosity, and uh, the spatial scale is defined in terms of the Taylor microscale, which is also a generalized type to define. But in any case, you always see a distribution which is more or less invariant. So uh, this is true, and this was more or less uh, stated in 1980 by this very famous guy, Townsend, and he said the rheology has, he was very, uh, uh, he made a very strong statement, has negligible impact on the statistical signature of the non-Newtonian turbulence. Should have, he didn't write it, so, but he didn't show it. So this agrees with the prediction that the structure of the Newtonian turbulence at the inertial sub-range is robust. He should have written, should be robust. And in fact it is, he was right, and it was expected. But now there has to be a mechanism through which the viscosity, the rheology of the fluid acts in order to keep this distribution of uh, vortex size is invariant, okay? And then this is what I wanted to show you, so. So this is the Komogor of dissipation scale, so, sorry. So uh, now I want to show you how, what's the effect of the rheology? And the key, a, key, a key word for, to understand the <coughs> effect of rheology is to try to understand how energy is dissipated into the system. So the, the vortex, the distributions is invariant, 
but it has to be to some cost of the energy dissipation. So there has to be a redistribution of energy in the system uh, for this uh, statistical distribution to become <coughs> invariant. So that's what we said. Uh, a non-Newtonian constitutive relations provide, of course, that, that we know, an additional degree of freedom to our system because the viscosity is not constant anymore. So we can calculate uh, how the dissipate energy, uh, how the energy dissipates in different ways for different rheological constants. So, uh, and that's how we calculate the, energy, the viscous dissipation in a cell. This is the rate of viscous dissipation uh, per unit mass in each cell of my grid in the numerical simulation. So, uh, so what we see here is that the dissipated energy is typically smaller inside the vortices than outside them, whatever, regardless of the rheological exponent I will show it for you. So as you can see here, we, we took the same cross-section that I showed you before for this, that shear thickening fluid. And what we see is that the dissipated energy avoids the internal parts of the vortexes, okay? So somehow they tend to become um, uh, less localized in terms of the vortices than uh, what we would expect. And in fact, when for different lambda values of lambda two, so this, for lambda two smaller than zero, you are always inside of the vortices. For lambda two larger than, than zero, you are always outside. So generally speaking, <coughs> Regardless of the uh, rheological exponent, uh, what you have is the same behavior for shear thinning or shear thickening fluid. But what do you see here is that it decreases as you increase lambda 2, and it also increases as you increase lambda 2 after the, this point 0 with a minimum value at lambda 2 equal to 0, which is exactly the frontier, the boundary of the vortices uh, in our periodic box. So it is generally the same qualitative behavior for different values of n, but as you can see here, the qualitative behavior is the same, but when you compare that with a Newtonian fluid, which, which is the classical standard behavior, they are largely different, especially at large values of lambda, lambda 2, where the energy is dissipated in the system, okay? And now we can quantify it a little bit more precisely. So the way to do that is to quantify, now we have the, the boundaries of these vortices, we can calculate the amount of energy dissipated inside and outside these vortices and make it as a ratio. So this is the ratio between the total energy dissipated outside and inside the vortices. And we are calculating it for the entire box and for many snapshots of our dynamical uh, problem. So when you do that and you compare this with the Newtonian case, which is pi equal to one, what you can see here is that uh, for shear thinning fluids, usually you have an augmented uh, dissipation you have an augmented dissipation inside the vortices uh, in contraposition to the shear thickening fluids, okay? So everything which is below one is shear thinning. Everything which is larger than one is shear thickening. So this is the uh, ratio between the, the dissipation outside and inside. So for shear thickening fluids, it dissipates more outside than inside, okay? So you can see that in a way Relatively to Newtonian fluids, shear thinning fluids, and smaller than one here, adjust to have an augmented dissipation inside the vortices, while shear thickening fluids dissipate relatively more, relatively to the Newtonian case, okay, uh, outside the vortices. Newtonian case is this point here where everything converges to the same value. So this shows up some sort of self-organization. So the fluid itself or self-organizes in terms of the way it dissipates energy to keep invariant the structure of the turbulence system. Okay, so that's what we found, and that's what we call uh, non-Newtonian fluids undergoing fully developed turbulence, self-organized in distinctive dissipative regimes at the microscopic scale, so as to display these invariant vortex distributions, and that's why we call it uh, self-organization uh, in the system. So this is the first part, so I, I somehow Manage try to, 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 to explain uh, what we meant by self-organization. The second part is slightly different, a little bit more complex, and we have no explanation. We only have results. And uh, this comes back to Andrei Kolmogorov, which was a mathematician who gave a seminar and perhaps one of the most conceptual contributions to, to the physics of turbulence ever. I don't know. But anyway, so... Uh, and. Uh, uh, what he did was he managed to understand a little bit. He, he was trying to understand how the correlations between uh, fluctuations of velocity in a turbulence system behave. And then uh, he used a, a, a structure function of RM, which is nothing more than a correlation function of a different order, depending on the, uh, the exponent that you put here. OK? 
Okay, so this uh, you can do that. So u is a, is the velocity in the fluid at the position x plus r. U is in a position r, r, and r is the distance between these two positions. So the correlation functions, as you might know very well. So what Kolmogorov did first, and that was an amazing contribution, he could derive exactly, exactly from Navier-Stokes equation, including the, non the, the inertial nonlinearity, of course, that the S3, exponent 3 here, was proportional to the radius, <coughs> and the constant of proportionality was 4 fifths of, multiplied by the average rate of energy dissipation per unit mass in the system. So it's called the 4 fifths law of Kolmogorov, which is exactly derived from uh, Navier-Stokes, and of course it has been exactly verified experimentally. So this is amazing. So of course, he didn't stop there. He tried to generalize that. Still, 10 minutes, no? <laughs> Oh yeah? Okay. So we have the 441 uh, theory, and then he tried to go to the 441 theory, and then what he did was he used, not, it's not a, not a close or exact uh, result, but what he did, he, he uh, conjectured that this is non-exact, non-closed. He conjectured that the exponents here are not uh, 1, but m over 3, where m is the order of the structure function of the system. So I will go. And then the funny thing about this is that, of course, this is very close to the experimental observations, but it's not perfect. Of course, because the theory is not perfect. And uh, although it came from Kolmogorov, and it, it has been uh, detected experimentally. So what we did here, we also calculate that for different rheological exponents. I will, I will have to go very, very, very quickly now. So we calculated, we did some uh, malabarism here in order to avoid uh, the difficulty of finding uh, large scaling regions. It's important to use what we call the extended self-similarity method. I will not go into the details of that, but it's possible to, to obtain with a little bit more precision these exponents. And we uh, detected for different rheological factors and different Reynolds numbers of the system, how this, uh, this, this structure functions relate with the uh, exact value that Kolmogorov proposed for S3. And then as we found, we found power laws everywhere. So from this power law that we know exactly, we could calculate uh, the different uh, exponents of the structure functions. And uh, this, this, is, uh, this uh, effectively holds. And then we found that the deviations from 441 theory, the anomalous scaling behavior, you don't see them here very well, but when you plot this in terms of a relative error compared to the prediction of the Kolmogorov here, this is the 441, uh, K41 theory, this is the solid black line here, you see that there is indeed anomalous scaling very similar to what was found experimentally. So for different rheological exponents, you have different anomalous scaling. This anomalous scaling is the, perhaps one of the most challenging uh, problems that turbulence presents nowadays. So uh, this is a, 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 some theory is expected for that. I've heard a gossip that this guy Pedalman is working on this. No, this is I'm not sure. Maybe he will find how to explain it uh, mathematically exactly. So uh, anomalous scaling, and uh, I finish here with my uh, hard team here. This is Santa Cruz. It is in the third division, but uh, we are always in happiness and adversity. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's time for uh, big questions. Uh, I could guess maybe I'll go with Ram first and then. Oh. I was wondering, you know, when you said that there's uh, this self organization, yes. uh, right? I mean, you don't mean, uh, in what way do you mean that it is self organized? Because it's not at microscopic level, right? Yeah, the viscous dissipation, of course, takes place at the microscopic level. Yeah. So, uh, so in what in what sense is it organized? It is uh, yes, it is organized because the system somehow keeps the structure, as I said, of the vortexes invariant at the cost of a redistribution of the dissipation energy. So so that you can add the, the final degree of freedom, which is mm -hmm. this non real this uh, non Newtonian behavior, but the structure is the same. So this is still to be understood. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, in a turbulent flow, you, something that happens with the vortices is that they get aligned with the strain. Mm. Have you checked whether when you change your your rheological properties that keeps happening? No, I didn't check that. 
Because that Very that important. may be related with why you have a change in where dissipation takes place. But what do you think is related to the non the non the Non-universal anomalous scaling or the self-organization? No, no, the change, in, I, I, I would expect that the change in where dissipation takes place, whether you have more dissipation inside or outside the vortices, has to do with how the small scale vortices align the strain. Okay, so this is an interesting point. Thank you very much. I tried it. Uh, any further questions? Uh, I had a quick uh, comment on the uh, exponents. So for the normal fluid as well, the deviation isn't as strong as uh, one typically expects for turbulent flows, right? Is that? This one. This is, yes. This is the Newtonian one, which is very close to the experimental one. We checked that. I see. And there is a funny thing here, very nice that you ask this. As you increase the rheological exponent to a larger value, the fluctuations start to disappear. And we did that for sufficiently high radius numbers to keep turbulence as visible, let's say like that. So this is interesting. So we and the measurements were within this 0.05. Yeah, but I don't see if there is any experiment to show that the non-anomalous scaling uh, is present in shear thickening fluids. Thank you. Okay. So let's thank the speaker thank once again. Uh, and we move on to the next talk by Nicola <coughs> on uh, network interferences and what drives them. Right. So you have 30 minutes. I bet you. Okay, um, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me here. It's really nice. It's my first time in the IFT. Uh, I've been loving it so far, and uh, I think they had uh, amazing talks. So, yeah, sorry for you guys, now I'm here. Uh, you'll have to suffer through me for half an hour. So, uh, I'm the last one here in the chain, Nicolas Rubido. I come from Uruguay, and this is work um, done by Rodrigo Garcia, a student from our group. Uh, I'm going to break a bit the rule that I have, usually not to present things that I haven't really uh, finished. So this is work on progress. But I think this is the perfect scenario. Uh, I do believe that you're going to have amazing comments at the end. So I'm uh, more than uh, waiting for them. And if you have uh, serious critical things, you can keep it to yourself. That's fine. <laughs> but uh, so um, my question is, uh, we've been doing network inference for a couple of years now. And I want to know, I become interested more in knowing what affects the effectiveness of that network inference, right? And when, when talking about network inference, usually you have two questions in mind. Sometimes people think of network inference as trying to get from time series measurements a functional network that resembles the structure. So try to, from the, the data, try to uh, extract the structure underneath uh, the system. And uh, the other one is simply to, to infer a kind of robust and reliable functional network, which is simply that you uh, maybe change the parameters and this functional network, which depends also on how you define it, uh, it doesn't change much. Um, so anyway, I'm going to be tackling these issues along the talk. Um, this is my framework, in a sense. So you take those n time series which come from different regions of your system. Uh, um, I've been working now for the past three years with a medical doctors, so they are they have kind of particular uh, setups. It's uh, of the brain, and that's their main main uh, system of study. And uh, they are interested in knowing how these regions, uh, either they are measured by EK, um, ECGs or uh, by fMRIs or any data. So how these regions of the brain, uh, parcels, neurons, and so on, how they are interrelated between each other. So in a kind of uh, reverse engineering, you have to go from the time series, the observations of what the brain is doing 
to uh, how they are uh, connected. And many, many people have worked in this problem. Um, what we know so far is, in, in a sense, and it makes also sense that, uh, to think about the brain as a kind of a small world network. Uh, I'm lucky to be speaking today after so many have already spoken about networks, so then I don't have to dwell too much on it. But basically, the brain is like on the top figure there, where um, it's neither completely regular nor it's completely random. It needs to be kind of in between because, well, a uh, completely regular lattice would be very inefficient in terms of, uh, of information processing, but it could be very efficient in terms of wiring. And on the other end, you might try to wire it a lot and then get very high efficiency in information processing, but it's, it would be extremely costly to, to, uh, to maintain it. So the brain is kind of in the middle, and there are many works showing that there are certain small world structures. And a small world, in a certain sense, is characterized by those two uh, properties, which are the clustering coefficient and the uh, average sh shortest path. So you have a, a short transfer uh, distance between any two points in your network. And you also have like a, a, a the friend of my friend, uh, the, my two friends are friends between themselves, like a sort of transitivity. So kind of uh, small groups of nodes. Um, so then uh, this is the classic paper by uh, Watson and Strogatz. So what they did to, to, to create a model of these networks is you start from a regular network and you start rewiring the links um, as the left picture figure, uh, shows. So you go from a regular to a completely random network. In between, there is a funny thing happening, and you can see it on the right picture, where you have the, as the probability of rewiring links increases, then there is at some point where the clustering coefficient stays up. It's very clustered, but the shortest path length decreases a lot. Uh, so our framework works, okay, um, in order to understand what topology factors affect my network inference, I'm not going to go and rewire somebody's brain, right? I can't do that. Uh, the committees will probably not allow me to do that. So what we did is, of course, create a model of it. Uh, and we had ensembles of small world networks in it. And also, in the other hand, we wanted to compare as well with the purely homogeneous uh, random networks of uh, Dorsch Rennie and Albert Rennie, uh, Paul Erdos and Albert Rennie. Um, so these are fairly common ensembles. And in order to fix their macroscopic properties, we chose the C elegance. So in that sense, we had ensembles of networks that resembled the C elegance so that we could fix a given number of nodes, a given edge, a kind of average degree, and then not explore, because each network has a huge parameter space to explore. Uh, and this, what I'm showing here, is the C elegance, and it's a worm that uh, it's been nearly mapped. Uh, some of the you here have worked in that project. <laughs> uh, and uh, well, I mean, it has. It depends on what you're looking at. It has uh, so many neurons of the order of a hundred or a bit more. Uh, and you can have, of course, a directed network. It depends on where you're working with the chemical synapses, the gap junctions, and so on. And it's it's well compartmentalized. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a fairly well-known network, and it has been thoroughly classified and, and also uh, argued that it's also a small world. So it's kind of like a real example of small world network where you, 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 you know the, net, the neurons. So you have like a con connectome and also uh, the neurons. Um, so then for our model, we took those ensembles, uh, either of small world, random networks, or the C elegance, and then we put into them uh, some uh, Isikiewicz maps. So the Isikiewicz maps we, we chose because of this table. So the Isikiewicz match maps are uh, kind of a, come from the family of quadratic integrate and fire models, so it's, it's an extension to a b-dimensional map. And this one, the good thing is like it can reproduce tons of different neuronal behaviors. So if you see uh, the line of the Isikiewicz map, you can see all pluses in terms of what kind of dynamics. The only bad thing about it is it's not biological plausible. So I'm safe here. I hope there are not <laughs> anybody say like, this is mental. <laughs> I mean, the only important thing about a neuron, this map doesn't have it, but OK. <laughs> uh, let's go on. <laughs> um, 
right, this map is what I was saying. I, I'm not gonna dwell on the uh, equations. Basically, it's, uh, it has two variables, a fast variable, uh, so it's kind of a charging state, and then a slow variable. Uh, so if you can see in the, in the lower equation, it's a quadratic uh, style of equation. So you have like a, a steep ascent where it spikes and then it drops down. And in, in the background, you have that slow variable, which is the um, uh, one is the, the membrane potential and the, the other one is the slow recovery. So you, you would see if you look at the parameter space, something like this, uh, which is you have the parabola there, the null line for the quadratic uh, variable, and the slow one, which is the uh, straight slope, the kind of red one, reddish curve when they intersect, so you have your uh, fixed points, right? And depends on the parameters that you choose, either the slope, it's bigger, smaller, uh, either the parabola is wider or is shifted. And here what I'm doing is simply in, uh, inputting an external um, signal. So at the beginning, the, the one it's, uh, it's kissant, I chose some, some parameters for the rest of the, of the model. And then without an external input, then I have two uh, fixed points, but one of them is attractive, so after a transient, then the neuron just stays quiescent. Uh, and the other one, you increase the, the external uh, intensity that you get, uh, you're feeding, and then suddenly you have bursting behavior. It depends on what you're choosing, you can have phasic behaviors and so on. So the, the, the time series uh, are shown on the right, and you can see the slow recovery on the bottom, and the top one are the spikes and the membrane potential, which is what you can measure at the end of the day. Um, so that would be our uh, interest uh, in, in measuring that variable and see if we can infer from that. So our, uh, specifically, our uh, ensemble of networks then have uh, different parameters. If you choose the frontal neural network of the C. elegans, it has 131 neurons, give it or take. Um, some edge density of 0 0.08, an average degree of 10.5. If you symmetrize, because as I said, that's a, a directed network with weights. So what we did is like keep it as simple as possible. So we symmetrize it, and then you get those numbers, a shortest path, average path of 2.5. So in 2.5 steps, you would be transversing the network in any in average uh, from any two pairs of nodes, then a clustering of 0 0.25. And then it comes the small warness. So that's a sigma parameter. That's the comparison on how clustered with regard to how short the path are. And then if the uh, small world parameter is higher than one, then you have a kind of a uh, good candidate for a small world network. Um, so this one has a 2.8. If you go for the global neural network, then uh, that goes even higher. But then I'm showing also on the right uh, the adjacency matrices, and next to them, the degree distribution. Right? And if you see, the global network already has some odd properties. I mean, it, it escapes a bit from the, the, sorry, the small world network. Um, and that's because, if, if you can see, nearly between 40 and 60 uh, in degrees, you have like a small bump there. So what happens is the global network shows some hubs as well. So that's a bit different than what you would get in any kind of ensemble of either what's Strogart's or any uh, Edward Rennie uh, ensemble of graphs. Right, so we have our networks. We have our model uh, neurons. We input all that. We shake a bit, let it run. We measure the time series corresponding to the membrane potentials. Uh, and what we do is the first thing that everybody does and we have done for quite a while is cross-correlate, right? Cross-correlate those signals and see uh, which ones are significant after a thresholding, and that's the red line, the horizontal one. Everything that is, that is above the line you could consider as, okay, this might be a good target for uh, uh, an actual link, so that's the functional link, uh, and then everything below, it's a zero, right? Um, so, and then on the right, I'm showing like what's the idea. So you have the functional connectivity, which is derived from, from that time series, and maybe you have, a, uh, as in the C elegance, all the, all the connectome, and then you can compare it with the structural acti um, connectivity. Why would I want that? Well, if, if I can compare the two, the functional connectivity that I've got with the structural one, at least I have a way of saying how far I am. I'm not looking as I, uh, as I posted in my title. I'm not looking to get a super efficient method. I don't care about how efficient I am. I want to know what topological factors affect that efficiency. That means, 
I go there, I measure my functional network, and then I say, ah, it's 40% far away from the real structured connectivity. Okay, so what happens if I go and twitch my, my topology? So I change something. Let's say I made it more clustered. I made it more a small world. Would it go up or down? Would it be closer to the structural, or would it be uh, far away? I change the degree distribution. What would it be, right? And that's uh, where I'm going. Uh, to quantify how far I am uh, as I change the network, um, it's, um, I use the rock curves that Christina mentioned yesterday. So these are our receiving operating curves. So what you measure is the number of true positives that you have got uh, contrary to the false positives. True positive means links that you have said, okay, these are actual links and they exist in the structural network. Uh, false positives are the ones that you said they exist and actually the structural network doesn't have. So you can use a true positive rate, you can use false positive rate, also you can use true negative rate and a false negative rate. In either case, you have only two of these variables um, independent. So you always have a plane. So what we did in our case is, okay, let's, do, let's ask the knowledge of one more thing, which is the edge density. If you fix the threshold on the correlation to match a given edge, edges. So you say, I have no idea about what topology my underlying network is, but I'm gonna fix the, to the, the threshold such that my ending to topology has a given edge density. Right? And that means given number of edges. So if I do that, then this rock curve actually becomes a line. You only need one of these variables uh, and you can compute all the others. So what we just fix is the number of true positive rates that we get and then start shifting. Um, so what happens when we pulse couple the maps in those networks? Okay, so you have an order parameter there that shows how it decreases. So what we will have is a region that it, it's of interest between 0 0.25 and 0 0.3. Below 0 0.25, the, the, the network of, of maps basically just does incoherent stuff. There is no uh, possibility of inferring almost anything. And after 0 0.3, the network starts to synchronize. And as you all know, if it's synchronous and you're looking at a functional network from a similarity point of view, then you're not going to get anything. And then, so we, we show here uh, at 0 0.23, what we, it happens is like there are trains of bursts, kind of semi-synchronous, and then in 0 0.26, there is, it seems like completely random, but actually there is certain coherence there, uh, which allows to, to do some inference. And these are the results for the uh, membrane potential, either for the, um, just the frontal C. elegans network and, or the global. And the same for the watt strogatz ensemble and the erdos Um as we change the coupling strength between the, 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 the maps. So if, if you see uh, 0 0.4, uh, high sensitivity, then that means that you, you got right for 40%, okay? <laughs> but that's the ensembles as they are. So you can say there, okay, then if it, the, the, the watt strogas gets the highest on the left figure, so it hints to the fact that maybe the small warness is an important parameter in terms of uh, improving your, your um, uh, inference. Um, whereas other things don't. So we, we started tweaking. Um, we get similar results if we go to the inter-spike intervals of the time series. I'm not gonna go over that. I don't have that better. Um, also, if we change the time series length, so we go from 50,000 to uh, 5, uh, 500 or whatever. I mean, uh, time length uh, didn't seem to, to matter too much for, for the cross-correlation as it's, it's also known. Um, but then we started tweaking what we did. It's like, okay, let's grab the ensemble of uh, erdos reni graphs and start improving their clustering, keeping the degree distribution fixed. What we did is a, a modified Maslow uh, step. Maslow proposed a, a rewiring where you take two pairs of nodes that are connected and you interchange the links. Okay, so you are maintaining the degree distribution of all the links, but you're kind of crossing. And for the erdos reni to get up higher clustering, what we do is we make a step, rewire the connections. If that clustering improves the clustering of the net, if that step improves the clustering of the network, then we accept that step. And in that sense, so the curve for the Erdos-Reni, which is the left curve, uh, figure, 
it goes from the bottom one, the blue curve, to, to the red one. So you go from 1.01 .01 of a small warmness coefficient, which obviously is not a small warm, to some kind of initial Erdos-Schwenny to some other ensemble that it's a, a small world. And in that, you go increasing your, your inference uh, success. We do that for the, uh, what's Strogatz model, so we do the same rewiring, keeping the degree distribution. So what we do is when you rewire uh, an already small world property, you are basically killing the small world. Uh, when they're rewiring, the muscle of the steps are taken. So you go from the top uh, curve, uh, 2.76, to the 1.12 in the bottom. So you kind of end up in an erdos rainy way. So uh, more or less this hints to us that uh, small warmness is, is a very important property. And if you look at the maximum uh, sensitivity that you get in all of these cases, you can see kind of like a steady growth as the small warmness coefficient grows. Uh, and that's how you calculate the small warmness coefficient, which is the, simply the clustering compared to the clustering of the actual network compared to a random uh, Edo Schrenny network uh, in relationship to the shortest path that you're getting with a, a regular one. So, our main conclusions are basically so far we have found that uh, um, high small warmness then is an indicator of uh, then uh, 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 favors the network inference that you're doing by p-variate cross-correlation uh, uh, inference, uh, uh, independently of the time series length, independently, uh, kind of reliably, or across the different time series. So you can do uh, membrane potential, you can do interspike interdots, uh, but also uh, regarding the, the particular topology. If you can tweak the topology, then always you end up in small warmness being a good thing. The other thing that we found is like uh, random connectivity achieves a larger sensitivity. So I'm going to do something that I don't like, which is if you look at the numbers here, so the absolutes of the sensitivity, one gets up to 0 0.5, and the other one uh, higher than 0 0.5, nearly 0 0.6, and the other one just uh, at the best gets to 0 0.5. Um, we still don't know why. That is, but it seems that there is, uh, um, when you, so you have the class of uh, those Rennie ensemble networks, you do a mass of step to increase their, their clustering, and you end up in somehow a small world network. Um, this one, in comparison to, uh, what Strogatz networks gets uh, better inference. And uh, if you go this way, so kind of in an inverse Maslow, you end up in an erdos uh, which is very similar to this one. So it's like a back and forth, but one has more effect than the other, and we still don't know why that is. Um, I'm gonna finish with some reference, and uh, thank you for your attention. Questions? We have some time. Oh, yes, sorry. Hello. Uh, very nice talk. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, the threshold mm -hmm. that you put in the uh, correlation function. Yes. Uh, um, could you explain that a bit because that seemed a bit um, so whatever is above the, the red actually. line, it's a link, and whatever is below, it's not a link. But you can move that threshold as you want, yes. right, up or down. Right. So what we choose is you put the the height of that that line such that the number of links that you get, it's fixed. And it's fixed to match the one from the C elegance. So then to, it's to what? the C elegance. So that was uh -huh. my C framework. So, so that one was the one that was uh, across ensembles. All the ensembles had the same uh, average degree as the C elegant, average uh, well, edge density, so on. OK. Um, OK, maybe there's a better way to do this, yeah. Definitely, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, so uh, yeah. <laughs> the threshold, it's, it's, a, 
is a well uh, used uh, method, but it doesn't really guarantee anything. Yeah. Uh, especially if, if if you go low, at some point you start getting uh, false positives yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, yeah, but how high to, do you go? The important thing is how high do you uh, go? The, the yeah. whole point of, of having a connected system is yeah. that you will get uh, very similar regions that are not directly connected. And sometimes directly connected regions which are actually not so similar in their dynamics. And that you will always have a problem when you have like an horizontal uh, threshold. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's one more question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nico, for this very, very nice talk. I have a question about, for instance, in your slide, I think it's slide number 15. Okay. I think that I observed, or this one, yes, this kind of rebound on ah, the yes. sensitivity. Hmm. Did you observe any correlation? I mean, oh. There is a change in dynamics there. Okay. Uh, there are a few things. Like, when I saw this picture, um, so Rodrigo showed me this picture, and I said, like, this is wrong. This is, you, you did it wrongly because, I mean, at the beginning it's below random. So it's like, it means like if I go there and measure randomly, you're getting a worse performance. And, and that struck me like wrong. I mean, I didn't even go that far as a whole. But it, the fact is like, because the dynamic changes as you change the coupling strength. So at the beginning you are systematically by this uh, method, uh, always picking things that are not there. Don't know why, and it's it's because of how this bursting regime that I showed here. You get something like this before the the jump, and that's that's like uh, from 0 0.2 to 0 0.25, and even below you have things like that, and that doesn't allow you to 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 infer. And then you get to that kind of little bump over there in 0 0.3, uh, which this orders into a, a completely synchronous uh, spiking. Then it, it jumps back again, and it goes back to this. And after that, it, still, it falls into fixed points, kind of like steady states. Okay. We have time for another quick question. Someone has one. Otherwise, let's thank uh, Nicola once again. <laughs> and uh, move on to the last talk of the day by Mario Schoppen. Um, high dimensional data and ordering and ranking. Perfect. 